right away, we're going to dive into the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with the 19th verse. And I'd like you to please join. Let's, let's read this together. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And so, first of all, that, that as we're looking at this, that, that it's saying, if you think in terms of this, that, that these might be kind words that help build up a family, but the picture of the Bible is also that each one of us are like one of these bricks that we are brought together. And so today, when we say that we are celebrating the, the family uh, at Crosswalk, family of faith, that we're not just necessarily talking about the individuals you came with that live at your house. I get it, that is your family, but, but there's more to family than that. And one of the ways, as an example, that, that I would maybe say it this way. This past week, I went to a church conference in uh, California, and I stayed at a hotel. And because I stayed at a hotel, and they got my email address, they sent me a link, and they wanted to know how my stay was. And so once you let them know, just put in the number, that takes you to a whole survey, and they want to know, will you fill out the survey? Okay, so I did it. And it was a nice stay. The, the hotel was great. But then at the very end, after I had filled it all out, they asked, can we know some things about you personally? And it's like, okay. Um, so, so the first thing they want to know is my gender. Then the, the next thing they want to know is how old I am. The next thing they want to know is whether I'm there on business or leisure. Then they ask how much money I make a year. Then they ask me how many times in the next year or how many times in the past year did I stay at a hotel and how many times do I plan on staying at a hotel in, in the future. And what they do with, with each one of these questions that I ask, they are slowly narrowing down and putting me in a group and in a category that they can market to, right? Right? And, and that's how they determine who I am, who Dan Salofra is, uh, according to their categories. But here's what they don't understand. Even though they can do that, because we are a family of faith, what that means is, Carmen, wave your hand over there. There she is, that's Carmen. She helps set up on, on Sunday mornings. Carmen and I have more in common than, than the individual's that fill out, that say they're a, they're a man in his, his lower 50s, who, who all of these different things, and, and Carmen and I, and I are more alike, and you know why that is? We have the same father. We have Jesus Christ as our savior. We have the same brother. We have more in common than all of those other people who have so many more things in common, so we would think. I want you to think about that. We are family, for goodness sakes. And, and no matter what happens, because you are going to get different things that happen in your life that say you, you have a different family. And I want you to think about what that would look like in the church if that's the way we approach things that have to do with racial tensions. And in the way that we deal with other people, that we don't look at the differences that we see in people, but rather we see what we have in common. And that is our common father and our, our brother and our savior, Jesus Christ, who came into this world. That is what we have. Earlier today, in the first service, there was a, a, a baptism. And Dorothea Krevchuk was the name of the, the woman who was uh, baptized. Baptized. And when she went up there for her baptism, um, I'm not going to say how old she is, but I'm going to say she's more than 20 and less than 100. So somewhere in there. Anyways, it, that as she was there, Dorothea was there, she had three other individuals standing up with her. She has been coming to Crosswalk for three years. 
And the women that stood next to her, none of them are related to her, but all three of them are her sisters. They are individuals that she has served with. They are individuals that have gone to Bible study with her. They are individuals who challenged her as she went through her relationship at Crosswalk to always take a next step. And sometimes the next step for her was just to come to church the next week. Sometimes the next step was to go to the Christian Essentials class. But then the the hardest ones for her that were when they told her, Dorothea, the next thing you need to do is forgive the people that have hurt you in the past because it was haunting her. And, and, the, and she had so much pain and she had so much hurt and so much heartache in her heart that, that they encouraged her, you need to forgive and let that go. And she shared with us as, as she had her baptism, that's when she knew as Christ has forgiven me, as she prayed the Lord's Prayer, forgive me my sins and Lord, I am forgiving those who sin against me. And then in a beauty of baptism, with the name Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as, as with, God, with water and God's word, she was welcomed into our family of faith. That's what I'm talking about, is that we have this beautiful, wonderful thing in the family of faith, and, and we need to celebrate it constantly. And this isn't about kids being in worship or not in worship. This is about all of us gathering together around what is most important. In the blank, you can write, because we are Christian, we are family. Because we are Christian, we are family. We are family because of the work of Jesus, first and foremost. That is where we find our identity. That is where we find our common father. That is where we find our connection. And the challenge now, as we do this, is to see what this means when we say building up the family of faith. What does this look like in my home? What does this look like in in a congregation? What does it look like when, when I come here on a Sunday morning, but I don't feel like I'm connected to other people? And, that, and the first part of it is this, is recognize you are connected. You are family, period, uh, because of our relationship with Jesus. The next section is from Ephesians 4. So it's a couple chapters later and it says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jewish people. So, so they would be individuals who don't have God's word. So what he's saying is because you're the family of faith that you have to live like those who know who Jesus is, that know you are loved, that have been forgiven by God and can also forgive. So don't live like those Gentiles, those who don't know God's word do, in the futility of their thinking. Because the way that they think, their thought processes are all going to be self-centered and not about being part of a family. So no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. And so you have this situation that, that as we're living our lives, we need to be careful that our hearts don't get hardened towards our family. And all of us have this issue because we all have a sinful nature inside of us. And the sinful nature by nature is selfish. And so one of the ways that I notice this in family, maybe I don't know if everyone will be able to relate to this as much as, as I can, but, but definitely some in, in the first service said they still have trauma from their youth because of this. And what I'm going to show you is there are five kids in my family. And so every once in a while, we'd go to South Dakota where my in-laws lived. And so we'd get into the minivan and mom and dad would get in the front and the kids would get in the back, which has two captain's chairs. And then the back one, the dreaded middle back seat. If, if you want something that can ruin a 12-hour car ride to South Dakota, middle back seat is it. And so this is what we did. We, we were, this caused so much problems, so many problems in our, our family that first thing my wife did was scheduled it. So here's what we're going to do. Five kids, it takes 10 hours to get to South Dakota. Every two hours, we're going to switch. 
And so you're just going to move. You're going to move from, we, we had these down, front left, uh, front right, back left, back right, center middle. And so we told them every two hours we would switch. And then the kids complained about that. They said, no, we don't, we don't want to take our turn in the middle back. And so they decided another way. And that was we took a hat and we, we took the little pieces of paper that said front, of course, we didn't write it all out, but we, we had the little things, and then each child had to grab where they were going to sit. And one of our sons, I'm not sure what his story was, he picked middle back every time. And, and he said he's going to write a story about his childhood trauma and call it middle back. And everything that we did to... to destroy his self-esteem, I guess. Anyways, the point is, is this, is in the middle of, of this whole process, all they could think about is themselves sitting in the back middle. And they never thought in terms of other people sitting in the back middle. And that's what seems to happen in our homes, is that we get so wrapped up in our own pain that we can't see the pain of those around us. Only the things that are most important to me, only the things that, that I want to see change and how it affects me are things that I can think about. And, and the problem with my kids is that the kids are a lot like their dad. And, and I think back, there were eight kids, eight kids in the family I grew up in, so we had... Three people in the middle back. I don't know how we did it. And it was a station wagon. But anyways. But, but the point is, is that with my brothers, we would pound on each other. And usually we would stop when there was crying or there was blood. The problem is, is that this is talking about the hardening of your heart. And you know when your heart is getting hard. When you can look at your spouse crying and you don't care. That, that you can see that the pain they are in and because of the pain that you are in or whatever it is, that your heart is now hard and it is cold. And I'm telling you, that is where the sinful nature lives. And, and that is the warning. In the blank, you can write, self-centered thinking, self-centered thinking tears family apart. It just rips it apart. It is the evidence of a serious heart problem. I'm telling you, if you're at a point where you don't care, that, that the, the, the tears and the pain of a family member no longer affect you, I'm not worried about them, and I'm not worried about what they've done. My concern is for you. My concern is that, that God would break your heart of stone. That's why David had to say, Lord, create in me a clean heart, a new heart, a heart of flesh, it also says in the Old Testament, Lord, replace my heart with one that cares, one that bleeds for you, Lord, one that shows the love that it has been showed by you. And so what I'm going to ask you to do, you don't need to write these down now, but the question there is important. What are some of my selfish behaviors that hurt my family? the behaviors that hurt my family. And what I would like you to do, again, you don't have to write these for everyone else to see, but newsflash, they already know what they are. And, and so for me, what I would say my number one hurt, the way that I have hurt my family, I've already talked to them after first service, is the number one thing that has hurt my family is my job. And just this past week, I'm in a, and, and I'm a pastor, for goodness sakes. So, so what, what does that mean? Here's what it means. I'm, I have a, a coach. I have a, a counselor slash coach that coaches me spiritually, emotionally, physically, in, and helps me once a month to have balance for my life. I have to have it. If I don't, I would be spinning out of control. So anyways, he asked me, I, I told him this month is, is just the pressure's getting to me. It's like, it's over my head, I'm stressed out. And he asked, what are the, number th the top three things going on in your life that are causing stress? And I said, number one, the, the church land and the church building. 
That, that if we're shooting for December of 2022, if we're going to make that, there are a lot of things that need to happen in order to make that date. And I don't know how I can help make that happen. Number two, uh, we need a third pastor, and we needed him nine months ago. And right now, the, the, the level of things that are happening are getting me to the point where they are at a stress level that is beyond what, I'm, what I think I can handle. And then the third thing is with our, our Midtown launch of, of Jeff being over there and then what that's going to look like and all, all, all of that. And he let me go on for half an hour. And then he asked me the one question. He said, Dan, what is your identity? And I know the right answer. <laughs> I know what I'm supposed to say. I'm a child of God, bought with the blood of Jesus. I know I'm supposed to say that. He said, that's not what your words are telling me your identity is. You've given me three top stressors in your life are job-related. You have not mentioned once the woman that you pledged to, to love, honor, and cherish for the rest of your life. How could she not make the top three? You have not mentioned one of your children or anything that they're going through. You have not talked to me about your relationship with God through Jesus Christ and how your devotional life is going, how your prayer life is going. And, and that's when I realized, oh my goodness, that, that I'm in this situation where my job, I've made the gospel of Jesus Christ into a job. And guys, I know you do it too. And I know the arguments, so don't even start. Well, that's how we put food on the table, dear. Yeah, would you like the kids hungry and then I'll be around more and, and be there for you more? I know. I get it. I get it about when you have to be gone and when you're around. But that's not what this question is. The question is, I'm not going to kick them. I almost did the first service too. What are the things I do to knock down the building project in my home? The second thing that I do is words. Anyone who knows me and has spent any amount of time around me knows that my words can be daggers. They are, I am one of the most sarcastic people I know and sarcasm, sarcasm does not build relationships newsflash, in case you didn't know that. It, it does just the opposite. That, that for me, it's, it's like I can't help myself. I haven't learned. Stephen tried to remind me, and my mom told me a million times, Dan, keep your mouth shut. Just for a minute, if you don't have anything decent to say, shut your mouth. That maybe your, your, your words should be like a little gift with a, with a bow on top, that when you give it, it's a gift to those who receive it. That would not be an accurate way to, to show what comes out of this mouth on a regular basis. And I apologized. And the final thing is anger. I'm a laid back guy. I'm, I am. I, I mean, I, I like to joke around. You guys, you know, you see that a little bit. I don't know how many of you have ever seen me mad because the, it is like a tornado event. And, and I say that because it's that quick as well. That, 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 that quickly I can go from joking to extreme anger back to calm again. And what that does for my children and my wife is they never know what's, when they open the door what they're going to run into. And, and it's wrong. And, and, and these are the times where, where I need to start of asking the question, where am I ripping this wall down that is keeping my family and my church family from embracing each other? And so I ask you to do it as well. And if you don't know what it is, ask. Because I'm sure that your family could give at least five off the top of their head of things that you, you do that, that knock the wall down. The next words, uh, he goes on, Ephesians 4. You were taught with regards to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, a perfect example of our sinful nature, but notice, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. 
And so we see what the sinful nature does, but now we see the Holy Spirit living inside of me. And notice the word, and, and to put on the new self, which is created to be like God, and it also, it, it's the new attitudes of our hearts. We need to be taught this. This does not come naturally. These are things where we need to go back to God's word and he teaches us and through the, the teaching of his word and the power of the Holy Spirit, he changes us. In the blank, you can write, I need to be taught to love like Jesus. I need to be taught. I need to have God's word around me. He, he changes my heart by showing me unconditional love. The single most important thing that you can learn here today is not how to treat other people differently and it's not to find out what your mistakes are. The most important thing is to have a heart change through Jesus Christ. That's it. To have your heart change knowing that you are loved by him and forgiven by him and you, you chew on that for a while and your heart and your life begin to change. Next page. And these are the words of the kids. Do not let any, that we had from the kids' message, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. We've already talked about that. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So with the words that I'm speaking, I want the words that I'm speaking to build other people up. In the blank, you can write, being family is a building project. You just are. You're in a building project. If you're in a family, which you all are because of your relationship with Jesus, as long as you're in a family, you're in a building project. And we'll fill in those other blanks. My family is not perfect. So my family is not perfect. The next one is a question, what needs to be torn down? And what does building look like? What does building look like? To help us with this, as you have those, I've gotten a few pictures. And so, first of all, we have the picture. This, is what a, this would be a, what a perfect family looks like if it were a building. And so this is Notre Dame Cathedral. And this is the, the family that I spent 25 years trying to give the appearance that we have at the Salofra home. So, oh my goodness, you have wonderful children. I know, thank you very much. My wife does a wonderful job raising them and they're always so courteous and they're always so well behaved. Thank you very much. Next slide shows the reality of what the, the, the family is like if you walk inside the front door and, and that is family on fire, right? And, and that, that the families, there are not perfect families. And I, 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 I don't want to just say there are not perfect families and let you off that easily. I'll say it this way. One out of four families in this room right now will call Phoenix Police Department to come to a domestic dispute. One out of four. Think about that. That, that that is the average in the city of Phoenix that at some point, one out of four families has not only has issues in their family, but issues that are so bad that either someone in your home or the neighbors are like, something's going on over there. You better send someone over like quick to make sure they're not killing each other. This is some serious stuff. And I have to believe that, that again, these numbers hold true to the people in this room. So then you have this other reality that at least half of the homes, if not more, are affected by drug and alcohol related behaviors with parents that are causing difficulties in marriage and, and in family as well. Granted, some of them also will be calling the police, so, so it's not necessarily 50%, but it's still this reality that in the families that we have, that in your families right now, what is going on, and, and again, th this isn't meant to... Uh, to, to scare you, this isn't anything like that. It's just meant to, that where you are at, if you are at a family, in a family right now that is really going through difficult times, there's a lot more like that that you don't even know about. But then the final picture is one that is, 
is important, and that is the, the building with scaffolding that, okay, the fire happened. The, the renovation needed to take place. And it's, there's hope, and there's, it's not beyond repair. We can come in, and it's going to take time. When I did this uh, little thing with the, the, the kids, in the first service, there were 30 kids here. You know how long it took them to stack the blocks? And, I, and as I was sitting thinking about the four minutes that you sat and watched, or the group sat and watched with the blocks, I was thinking, why didn't I should have done this a different way so it would happen more quickly? But then it dawned on me, building projects aren't quick. The, the number one things they take is, is patience. So if, if that's what it takes to sit here and watch the kids stack the blocks so that something is built, just sit down and watch it. Be patient. Building projects take patience. And, and they take time. It's easy. The fire only takes a day. And, or, and maybe not even the whole day. And the damage is done. And now it's, it's not just days, it's months, it's years until the, the building project can be completed. It is two years ago. Two years ago, I got a call from a friend. And he said, Dan, I'm down in Phoenix. And I said, oh, sweet. I'll, we can get together and uh, maybe have supper. And he's like, yeah, that's not going to happen um, did my pastor call you? I'm like, no. I'm, I'm down here in uh, a 90-day recovery um, situation. And uh, yeah. And this individual is like, yeah, my job told me I can't come back for, they've given me a leave of absence. And so right now I'm, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And so I, I went to visit him once a week. And of course, he couldn't be at a recovery home in Levine. It was up on Shea and the... Ah. Anyway, that's a whole other story. But I went to see him every day. Uh, or excuse me, not every day, once a week. And uh, so I went to see him once a week. And over that period of time, his wife called a number of times, was going to divorce him, all of it. I mean, the whole thing imploding, life falling apart. And slowly, week by week... He, he continued to work the program, grew in his relationship with Christ, battled these, the demons of alcohol. After 90 days, uh, he, he was able to leave the recovery. He went back home. He used an opportunity that he had off being off work to get his fam, family together. Uh, he's, he's about my age, a little bit older, so his kids are older than mine. Uh, so the kids weren't at home. But then he, he worked on his marriage worked to, to get himself healthy. And then he, he, this last year, was able to work, uh, completed that year, so he's two years sober. And he texted me this morning. My 25-year-old son is in rehab. When in, I took him in today. To which I said, great. Thank God that you were able to navigate these waters over the last two years, that you understand the pain and the hurt that's been caused to your family, and now that you're in a position where you are able to help and support and love your son and let him know that it's not about perfection and it's not about not having fires, but what it is about, it's about building the scaffolding. It's about getting back into a building project where the first things we do is, is we confess our sins and our shortcomings and go to the cross of Jesus where there is forgiveness. That's what it looks like, I'm telling you. It's a lot of things, but pretty isn't always one of them. It's dirty and it's messy and it's hard and it's painful and it's beautiful. Next verse. So where does it start today? Oh, no, I got tears in my eyes. Too. You guys are going to have to help me read this one. All right, let's read it together. Children, 
Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Sorry about that. Every once in a while, it comes and gets me. Um, yeah, this is good. So this is where it starts today. It starts, sometimes kids, it just starts with obedience. Listening to your mom and dad because they have the best in mind for you. It's believing your mom and dad care about you and that when they do this, that they, hey, Go to bed, it's bedtime. Do your homework. Listen to your mom, listen to your dad. That's just the start, the very basic building blocks that you begin to build in these relationships. Parents, and especially fathers, this is one of my favorite, do not exasperate your children. To aspirate means to breathe. So that's, asp- that's when you aspirate, that's breathing. When you ex aspirate. That means you make them breathe out. So I do that when I tell stupid jokes, dad jokes. That's like, don't exasperate your children. But that's not what this is talking about. This isn't talking about bad dad jokes. This is talking about things that you do that take the breath out of your kids, that take the life out of them. You're an idiot. Do you have a brain in your head? You know the things, right? Those, those comments that you make that crush them. And what you're saying is dads especially, and all parents, realize the power you have to crush your children and never use it. But instead, build them up. Offer them forgiveness. Offer them hope. Offer them the things, the same thing your Father in heaven offers to you. Offer them forgiveness. Offer them a model. Show them how you confess your sin and forgive it. Maybe as you have your spouse, be a model for that. This is how we deal with issues in our our, our relationship. We deal with them head on. This is unconditional love. I'm going to continue to love you just like God loves me. So children are to obey and parents are called to build up and teach. And then the final one that Stephen read as well. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. You are not going to be able to build each other up without forgiveness. That's the essential part. So a necessity of every Christian family is forgiveness. Forgiveness. First, the forgiveness that God has for you, then the forgiveness that you offer to others. And the question there is, how am I going to be kind and gracious to people in my family to build them up? You need a game plan, people. <laughs> you just do. Uh, in this, that I've had this as a wedding sermon before, and I've had it in my wedding class. The 12 most important words in a marriage also happen to be the 12 most important words in a family. And they are, I was wrong, I am sorry, I forgive you, and I love you. And and as you leave here today, everyone in your family needs to use all 12 of those words because there are times when you are wrong. And then because our hearts are like Jesus, we are willing to say, I'm sorry, that it hurts my heart to do wrong to you. And the response to that then is, I forgive you. That in the same way Christ has forgiven, I extend that to you, and I love you. I'm committed to you. Uh, We are going to get through this. And I don't care if your family is the family of the people you came with. It's the family of faith here at Crosswalk. This beautiful journey of faith that we have is very personal, but it was never meant to be taken it alone. Continue moving forward with us. We are a family. You are my brothers and sisters in the truest sense of the word. Don't ever forget that. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you have begun a beautiful building project inside each and every one of us. You use your law to destroy and and knock down to the foundation our lives, but then you build us up with words of love and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Help us first and foremost to nurture that relationship, to understand that we are loved in our lives, and then let that overflow in our lives to those we care so much about. 
help people here at, at Crosswalk to come together in families and groups and, and friendships in, in so many different ways to let them know they are not alone, uh, that not only are you their God, but we are truly their family. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.